the ancient Greeks, both of them had any sister, who was punished by eternal toil to roll a boulder up the hill and constantly have it roll back down. In the 21st century, we call that arguing on the internet. But I'm here to introduce a man who somehow has overcome that and not only changed people's minds, but changed people's lives. Arguably descended from the Norse gods, I'm here to introduce a speaker who not only performs weddings and publishes paper on bird dinosaur evolution and campaigns in the much needed area of Texas education, but has always been a toilessly cheerful advocate for the ownership of evils. This is the most honest man to ever appear in the weekly world news and a YouTube superstar. Let's have it for R and Ross. I get to follow uh, the director for the Richard Dawkins Foundation. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> that was that was a very good speech. So I guess I'm going to be a bit challenged, but I'm going to be droning on today about my favorite subject, uh, the, uh, the systematic classification of life. And I'm not going to be presenting this lecture the way that I would for a classroom full of students who share my zeal for this particular subject. Rather, uh, this will be tailored to address controversies of how the classification of life, how taxonomy confronts and conflicts with religious extremism. Um, as strange a concept as this may be for those who have never shared that mindset, there are some people who would rather believe a fantasy than to understand reality, and they will distort data however they need to achieve that end. And so I'm kind of tailoring this talk to address certain points of view. When you're discussing the tree of life, some people who are trying to discredit it. Now, imagine you lived a couple hundred years ago, before anybody knew hardly anything about biology, when even the scientific community believed that life began as a magical enchantment. Like this guy. He believed that living bodies were animated by an enigmatic essence, which he thought could be extracted as a vaporous fluid. <coughs> Such as works. Oh, good. Like so many of his contemporaries, he believed that rotting garbage, carnage, and feces would miraculously and spontaneously generate maggots, vermin, and disease. Now, where, uh, where flies and rats and bacteria really come from seems so obvious to us now, just like evolution seems obvious to us now. But back before we understood the operation or applications of science, people were much more open to mysticism. It was mainstream then because we literally did not know any better. Of course, this idea was eventually disproved. Do we have this lined up right? Okay. And replaced with a new hypothesis, one that remains consistent with natural chemistry and is also very promising. Uh, as a matter of fact, the original samples from the old Erie Miller experiment were taken out of storage and re-examined after uh, Stanley Miller's death in 2007. And it was discovered that it was that 22 amino acids were produced in that original experiment under conditions now considered consistent with a volcanic environment in the prebiotic earth, and that is one of the many catalysts that they proposed for the origin of life. Now, a more recent experiment uh, that, let's say that showed a cycle of inundation, dehydration, and irradiation repeating cycle showed relatively simple chemicals becoming increasingly complex as the cycle continued until they eventually spontaneously generated ribonucleotides. So there's a lot of potential for this hypothesis, but a lot of people don't want to accept that, and they don't want you to accept it either. That's why if you look into college-level biology textbooks, you will likely see accurate descriptions and distinctions between these two unrelated notions. But if you look up either of these terms in probably any common dictionary, you'll see that abiogenesis is spontaneous generation and that it has been discredited. I have written to dictionary.com about this three times. They're not changing it. They know it's wrong and they don't care. The same goes for the other dictionaries spreading the same lie. For some people, uh, whether you believe something matters more than whether it is true. And um, that's why they don't want you to have the benefit of education. 
They know that their perspective cannot withstand honest inquiry, and they don't want you to have the advantage of being able to think critically or analytically. And uh, their uh, methods don't change either. A hundred years ago, this guy was a presidential candidate. How embarrassing would our, for our country would it be if we still had people like him running for office today? <laughs> I have some notes I want to kind of stick with here and a little bit out of sync with them. Bear with me one moment. There we go. Yeah. Now, however bad things seem to be today, they were worse a hundred years ago. Uh, when I was here last year, I talked about how uh, people back in the day, back way back in the day, had all kinds of crazy ideas for the origins of different forms of life. They had different origins for different forms of life that they would speculate about. Now, they had fossils, of course but they didn't know what they were or what they meant. They had no idea about how they were made. Now, if you found something that had clearly once been alive, but was now turned to stone, that might prompt you to believe in basilisks and gorgons. Uh, if you found something that's made of stone, clearly alive, and you believed in vitalism, maybe you would think that it was originally made of clay and was animated by an evanescent spirit. Having no knowledge at all of geologic upheavals, deep time, or tectonic movement, finding fossils of fish and seashells, even in inland areas, might even prompt you to believe that there had once been a worldwide flood. Having no knowledge of fossils at all, parochial people tended to view biodiversity as a collection of magically created kinds, each in their own distinct categories. Uh, that is, until one of them began looking into these categories so deeply that the impassable distinctions between these kinds disappeared. Uh, as you can see, in 1735, Carl Lynn, more famously known as Carolus Linnaeus, began with three grand kingdoms, animals, vegetables, and minerals. A few months ago, I went to a lecture by a creationist named Frank Turek, and he put up a poster or a, a picture of a fetus and asked us all to say whether it was animal, mineral, vegetable, or human. Because he wants us to say, oh, of course, that's uniquely different than everything else in the universe. I answered it was three out of four. Humans are animals, according to every definition I know of. Animals and plants are both made out of minerals, too. So. Obviously, I already have a problem with this system, so we'll take the elements of the periodic table and put them in another, uh, another discussion and take animals and plants and put them together in the category of living things, along with algae and fungus and protists, as well as uh, bacteria and archaea. So, three kingdoms became two, and then five, and then six, or maybe seven, depending on how we can if we can figure out how protists should be accurately categorized. But we're getting way ahead of Linnaeus at this point, because he didn't know about all these other definitions. What he did discover was a little disconcerting for his essentially creationist perspective. Um, let's see, he found there we go, a series of subgroups within supergroups. Uh, each category contains multiple subsets, which can be further subdivided. And the parent categories can also be filed together into larger boxes, so that the main boxes of life would only have two or three other main boxes in it. He didn't understand this. And the pinnacle of his frustration came when he found it impossible to segregate humans and apes into separate boxes. Um, more biased, less progressive, contemporaries came to his aid by arbitrarily uh, contriving two boxes, one called Pongo for all of the other apes, and then one for humans alone. Now, for centuries we've known that Pongo was an invalid taxon, but we needed to prove it definitively, and we couldn't do that until we began mapping genomes. Ultimately, uh, Linnaeus constructed or conceived 
a system of ranked categories, and he further encumbered this network by giving each rank a name, as if the family level of one lineage was somehow equal to the family level of another lineage. It, uh, it turns out they're not always equal, and there weren't enough ranks either, so we've had to invent more. We had to invent a uh, subphylum, superfamily, infra order, and so on, until it got to the point where we couldn't even agree which names applied to which levels. And some levels don't even have names anymore. Remember that these seven original tiers were proposed in the 1700s. We've since fleshed this out so much that if we were to show this exact chart the way we know it today, it could not all fit on one page and still be legible. And um, obviously, that being the case, uh, the Linnaean taxonomy is a bit outdated. It's been recently integrated with a more modern system, cladistic phylogenetics. Uh, however, to understand that, you need to look at something simple, and this is still basic. Now, I'm not sure I'm going to stay on track. In modern, tech, or modern terminology, each of these boxes is a clade, uh, like a set of Russian dolls where each one fits inside of a larger one. Um, each of these boxes encompasses all of its descendants, or its apparent descendants, as it would be the case here, obviously, Linnaeus did not see it this way. Uh, and let's see, the definition for, let's see, hold on. Yes, the definition of this clade is any member of this clade that also shares these traits, the definition of this trait, you know, this clade is any member of this clade that also shares these traits. So the definition of this clade is any member of all these other sequential nested groups that share all these traits in common without any deviation anywhere, never a miscommunication. Now guess who can't explain that? If these, if life were magically created, it wouldn't be like this, because a miraculous conjurer would not have to adhere to and abide by the strict rules implied or imposed on a biological process. A magical creator could have arbitrarily chosen at any time to give one lineage of mammals feathered wings, for example. In fact, every creature or monster we've ever created for any fable or movie has always violated taxonomy, such as the nature of created things. So a god could have spoken into being millions of deviations from this structure and certainly would have created at least a few, but there are none, nothing that doesn't fit. Mammals with feathers are one of many things we would readily accept from a being with the powers of a genie such is not possible for population genetics. And that's why we don't see such things except in mythology. Remember, Linnaeus couldn't understand this. He could see that it was this way, but he didn't know why it was this way. Modern creationists can't account for this either. They don't even acknowledge it. Instead, they ignore it and try to parody reality into something ridiculous. Look how creationists describe evolution. <clears throat> Ray Comfort says to Pat Robertson, two greatest examples I can think of, he tells Pat Robertson that evolutionists believe that an amorphous mass of meat appeared out of nothing, sat around for millions of years inexplicably, then suddenly grew eyes, legs, and a tail and turned into a dog for no apparent reason. And then it had to go look for another amorphous mass of meat that suddenly turned into a dog, a female dog for no apparent reason. This is how badly they represent evolution. And, and tell me that he, does, that he does this after so many decades that he does what he does. Tell me that he's doing this honestly, that he doesn't know better. Right? How is it possible that he could say something like that without deliberately lying about it? There's no acknowledgement of relationship at any level. Certainly not at this level, but not even between the genders of a single species. That's how afraid these people are that they might understand this and consequently accept it. Now, when we look at this, we see that the, I don't know if I can move around here with it. Uh, when we look at this, we see that the earliest, whoa, there's a bit there. <laughs> the earliest members of this clade look like possums and shrews, which look very much like each other. Uh, shrews and possums are basal karyotypes, meaning that they retain a strong resemblance 
to the earliest members of this clade now known only from the fossil record. It also means that they're very generalized. Generalized, generalized means they're a jack of all trades. They can adapt to any situation and become specialized, which of course imposes limitations. But at this stage, shrews, possums, and things that look like them could branch into many different groups, and they evidently did. One of those grants, or one of those clades being carnivora, which then blossoms into its own order. Now, as these early carnivores evolved into cats, creationists would argue that that's not evolution. That's just adaptation. Then, as cats evolved the genus of panthers, the creationists would argue, but they're still cats. They're supposed to turn into something else. And then as cats, or as uh, panthers become a specific species known as leopards, the creationists would argue that that's just microevolution, and so it doesn't count. Well, of course, that's not right either, because variation at the species level and above is macroevolution, and yes, that has been directly observed and documented dozens of times. But more importantly, they refuse to accept it as evolution unless it produces something so different from its parents that they can't possibly be related, which, of course, would violate the rules or the laws of evolution. Now, if you want to understand what evolution really is, honestly, then this is an important point I want you to remember. Evolution never suggests nor permits that one thing ever gave birth to another fundamentally different thing. Anyone who tells you otherwise is trying to present a straw man fallacy. Evolution is never more than a change in proportion, be it anatomical or biochemical. Unique attributes or mutations may arise in a single individual, but it doesn't become an evolution until it is inherited and spread through enough subsequent descendant generations that those traits become common and representative of a population. Every new genus or species or whatever that ever evolved was just a modified version of whatever its ancestors were, as indicated here. So that evolution at every level is just a matter of incremental superficial changes being slowly compiled atop successive tiers of fundamental similarities, which are indicative of taxonomic clades. Now, Darwin found the answer that Linnaeus was looking for, because remember, he couldn't explain this. But even before that, it was already obvious that life forms did not fit into the neatly distinguished boxes we would accept of created kinds. For example, look what happens when we try to add our own lineage to this box. <laughs> now, the first thing you're likely to notice is the branching tree pattern, which is inescapably obvious and obviously indicative of an evolutionary procession. Linnaeus did not see it like this because there was no mechanism he knew of that could connect these boxes. Let's see. Um, now, creationists will accuse us of assuming common ancestry or of contriving illustrations like this. This is no illusion. And it matters that it was conceived, or that it was first detected, I should say, by a pre-Darwinian, essentially creationist. And each of these boxes has specific criteria for its members. Uh, Animalia uh, is eukaryotes with an, an internal digestive tract, multicellular eukaryotes with an internal digestive tract. Chordates are animals with a spinal cord. Uh, mammals are chordates with lactal glands, follicles, warm blood, and so on. Uh, now let's go from the bottom up. This box includes every alleged race alive today and several more that are now extinct. You think this is the human box, but it's not. This is the human box, and it includes a lot more than just our species. Um, Neanderthals, Homo erectus, uh, hobbits, uh, possibly even Australopithecines, depending on how inclusive your criteria is. The family level, hominidae, has been redefined in the last 20 years or so. Uh, it literally means the family of great apes, meaning that we are classified as a subset of large apes. Hominid used to mean um, half-human ape men who weren't fully evolved. I remind you, I'm talking about recent changes, and you, the only way you would even know about these recent changes is if you are a cladistics nerd. 
Uh, sorry to say. Anyway, um, hominid used to be half human, unevolved, ape men, but we realized that being not fully evolved doesn't make sense because evolution never completely stops. Uh, we also realized that it didn't make sense to classify anything paraphyletically, meaning that it doesn't make sense to say that this clade includes all of these ancestors and maybe these, but not these. A clade is a monophyletic taxon, meaning that it includes all of its subsequently subdivided subsets. Um, and mammalia, or theria, is an excellent example of a monophyletic clade. Whether you're talking about panthers or people, we're all mammals, and we always will be. The same goes with monotremes and marsupials. Whales did not stop being mammals and become fish. They're still mammals, even if they don't look like it anymore. And I need to explain this too. Um, even if whales were to lose some diagnostic trait of mammalia, like mammaries, for example, they would still be mammals, and still would be no matter how much more they change over millions of years from now, because modern systematic classification isn't dependent on the traits or the characters that you currently possess. It's based on your evident phylogeny. It's based on evolution. That's why whales and snakes are still considered tetrapods, even though they don't have four legs anymore. We know that their ancestors did have legs and that they retain vestiges of those limbs. Now, a paraphyletic taxon uh, is one that includes only some of its ancestors and preferentially excludes certain others according to some convention, uh, arbitrary convention, best questioned and corrected. A good example of that is lizards. Uh, the lizard is a paraphyletic term meaning all descendants of the order Squamata, except snakes. Why not snakes? We know that snakes evolved from lizards, and they are definitely part of that subset, so why does it stop being a, a lizard the moment it becomes a snake? It's just a convention. An indefensible mindset that we've fallen into and have never corrected. In other words, tradition. <laughs> Two more examples of that are fish and reptiles. The definition for reptile is really well known. It's a cold-blooded, egg-laying, clawed uh, tetrapod. Except, and by this definition, many of our ancestors were once reptiles. Except that not all reptiles are cold-blooded. Not all of them have scales, or claws, or even arms and legs. Some of them give birth blind, and some of them led to warm-blooded descendants like mammals and dinosaurs. If you're going to use the word reptile cladistically accurately, it has to be synonymous with the word diapsid or member of diapsida, in which case none of our ancestors were ever reptiles. Fish is another term that doesn't have any applicable definition that is consistent for all things that are universally accepted as fish. Uh, some of them have fins instead of, or have legs instead of fins. Some are warm blooded. Some don't have scales or lack fins on their tails. And there are some things that are very much like fish, but aren't fish, yet they still have gills. So the only way the word fish would be taxonomically accurate or consistent is if it were synonymous with the word chordate. However, we are all chordates. And I'm betting at least some of you will argue that we are not fish. <laughs> the last good example of a paraphyletic taxon is wolves. Dogs descend from wolves, but dogs are not considered wolves. Conversely, the ancestors of wolves are considered dogs, but not the same as domestic dogs. They're definitely different. And this is where one of the most notable contributions to science that Linnaeus ever made gets thrown under the bus. Uh, binomial nomenclature. Homo sapiens, Panthera pardus, naming the species by the genus name first. Oh. <laughs> I can tell I'm not used to this type of mind. My apologies. Uh, wolves are Canis lupus. Domestic dogs are traditionally Canis familiaris. But it shouldn't be that way. Because the, uh, the dogs didn't diverge at the genus level. They diverged at the species level from wolves. So the proper name for domestic dogs should be Canis lupus familiaris. And it would get even worse 
if some breed of dogs were to, to, to develop its own genetically distinct breed or species, because then you might have Canis lupus familiaris dog suit. And a polyphyletic taxon is one you almost never hear about. Seriously, how often does this come up in conversation? Uh, monkeys are an excellent example of, of polyphyletic taxon because most scientists still consider it fashionable to say that old world monkeys and new world monkeys did not evolve from a common ancestor that was a monkey itself. Why? Because the law of monophyletic variation would mean that anything that descends from a monkey is still a monkey. That means apes would be monkeys, and so would we be, since we are apes also. I argue that just as humans evolved from apes, apes evolved from monkeys. Circapithecidae, for those of you who know what that word means, are not the only old world monkey group. They and hominoidian, the apes, share a common ancestor in a now extinct paraphyletic grouping called Propliopithecoidea and previously Parapithecidae, which even the New World monkeys are descended from. So that would mean that we and the other apes are really large, tailless, old world catarine monkeys right now. Not come from monkeys, not be like monkeys. We are monkeys. That's not a popular idea. <laughs> it's not widely accepted to be sure, but it is defensively accurate nonetheless. I have another video that explains that in more detail if you're interested. The name Pongo used to be, essentially, all living apes except people. And this is the way it always was since the days of the names. But having any grouping that says all of these type things except us is essentially a Freudian admission that we are already aware that we are one of them. And now that we've come to terms with that and can finally admit it, then Pongo has been redefined. It is now a genus applicable to orangutans and their relatives, Cebopithecus, that can't speak, Cebopithecus, Rhombopithecus, or Gigantopithecus, and so on. They are a genera in the family of great apes, along with Pan for hypnodons and chimpanzees, and the different types of gorillas, and different types of humans, extant and extinct. And of course, we know of more extinct species than there are current ones, and that's probably true of every plate, in fact. The closer you get to the point of evolutionary divergence, the more similar, for any two taxonomic groups, the more similar those two groups will appear to be, especially in their infancy. And this is an interesting trait. If you want to see how closely related some things are when you look at the infants of both groups, they're going to look more alike than the adults do. It again follows like a, like a taxonomic trait. Now, the earliest primates looked a lot like the earliest carnivores. And these two groups drifted apart they're actually quite far apart, but just for purposes of illustration. And each diversified in their own way. But at some level, they're both still mammals. They're both still the same kind. And they share all the parent categories from that, from that point on. So no matter how you view it, they share common ancestry. Let me just want to get myself in order. Okay. So, despite the claims of creationists, we've seen that Linnaeus had already glimpsed the tree of life without any knowledge or even suspicion of evolution. Uh, we have since found many, many more clades in this and myriad other lineages, and 21st century genomics has now confirmed all this. So we've established a twin nested hierarchy. Note that we've determined all this without any reference to fossil forms so far. And that's important when this topic comes up in conversation with the creationists. It's as the previous speaker mentioned, we don't even need the fossils to establish this. And indeed, this was established before we knew what the fossils were or what their significance was. When we found out the significance of the fossil finds, the situation from the creationist perspective became exponentially worse. Let's see, 200 years ago, a 12-year-old girl um, discovered what she and her British neighbors thought was a crocodile. Now, crocodiles were not necessarily uh, popular in England, 
Um, but if you lived there in 1810, how else would you describe this? In fact, she discovered many of these. Uh, her name was Mary Anning, if I haven't mentioned it. She didn't get adequate recognition during her life, so we am try to give her some now. Eventually, she realized, with the help of other leading minds of the day, uh, it would, to which she was included at one point, uh, that this was not a crocodile because of the bones in what would presumably be the hand here, which are all but fused into a flipper. So they decided that it was a different kind of crocodile, one that would crawl out of the water uh, whenever it came time to lay its eggs on land. But then they discovered this. Imagine what an impression this made. This is the same skeleton that they had previously identified as a crocodile. And now they know how wrong they are. Now, at this time, there were people around who still believed that whales were fish. I know because I met people like that when I was a child. And just as a dolphin is, is, is like making a fish out of a mammal, this is making a dolphin out of a reptile. It didn't make any sense. Why would a god make something like this? And of course, it got even worse. I don't know, let me see if I can get to it. I don't know if I got the next slide in here, so I need to check that. Okay. Yes. All right. What was worse, of course, is that she found many of these things. And then she, the, first, the little girl that found the first ichthyosaur also found the first plesiosaur. Now, her fossils were taken for examination by Georges Cuvier. Uh, along with a Mosasaur that was presented to Cuvier by none other than Napoleon. Um, Cuvier was an expert anatomist, and his unparalleled ability at that time has him today recognized as being the father of paleontology. He said something that was first to say it that caused a great deal of unrest in the religious community at his time. People had argued that all these animals that this little girl was finding, and that other people were finding all over the world, certainly must still exist in some remote locations on the Earth. But Cuvier said no. He was the first to say that whole species, whole lines of species, had vanished from the face of the Earth altogether. And this, it seemed to many people, violated God's plan. It got even worse as these people began to discover these things categorically, and they realized that certain ones tended to be found together in strata together and that they did not appear above or below certain areas. And most importantly, that modern mammals never appeared below the point that was already universally identified as being before our time. Now, why this geologic column even existed was a mystery to most of these early geologists who were primarily Christians because they did not ever find the evidence of the worldwide deluge in the type of damages that they could find. They can find seashells, they can find them. There were areas that were once underwater, but they also find areas that were not, or that are not concordant, or that do not show the kinds of damages and extent of, of deposits that were consistent with that idea. There were too many impossibilities, so they excluded that. Now, make it worse, we still keep finding ichthyosaurs. And look what's happening here. Here we have something that looks like Eric's first idea of what an ichthyosaur was. This is something that could actually get out of the water, or looks like maybe it could, if it had to lay its eggs on land. We now know that they laid eggs, whether they gave birth live. Um, but look at the transition. These are all ichthyosaurs. These are all the same kind, according to creationist uh, terminology. So this should be a matter of microevolution. And yet the transition is as macro as it can get. These aren't the only ichthyosaurs we found, either. We've got all shapes and sizes, and they all show the same thing. Most people have no appreciation for the overwhelming volume of extinct species we found. I'm not talking hundreds, I'm talking thousands of thousands. We have so many fossil forms that it is easy to say that there are more things that are dead in this world than alive now. And this plague, this is just the ichthyosaurs, remember. This clade fits into this larger one. Here's it. Right there. So 
So as you can imagine, all of these others, most of them anyway, open up into equally large categories. Now, when I testified for the Texas Board of Education, one of the creationists on that board, Ken Mercer, suggested that there were two different trees of life. He said that there was one that was indicated by morphology, and that's the anatomical structure of the animals themselves, and that one, he said, agreed with Darwin. But, he said, genetics did not agree with Darwin, that it was a discordant tree. And I didn't know what he was talking about or what he was referring to at that time. But he wanted everybody to agree with him individually, as we testified, whether the statement was true, that it would be a factual error to say that the genetic tree and the morphological tree would always match. I didn't understand what, quite what he was going through. I tried to clarify that there are times when the uh, genetic tree or the, the, the phylogenetic tree, the tree of genome exclusively, usually concurs with what we've determined morphologically. Uh, but there can also be corrections, like we had put uh, anteaters and, and uh, Penguins in the same category. They don't belong in the same category. Uh, we, we thought that bats were closer to primates. They had to accept insectivores. We found out through the genomic sequencing that aardvarks were actually closer to elephants than we thought that they should be. So in each of these three cases, the node would shift a bit, but there's still eutheria in mammals. The morphology and the genome both match the type of tree you see here. So Common ancestry is always implied, at least until you get to the level of microscopic unicellular organisms. Then the tree of life looks more like this. Now, instead of the normal branching tree pattern, where regular evolutionary development, remember, you have to remember that evolution is summarily defined as descent with inherent modification. Now, in order to have descent, you have to have ancestors which is why evolution is not an explanation for how life began. It's only an explanation of how life diversifies. And it doesn't account for everything. I mean, there's, what's going on here is not necessarily evolution because we're not talking about a descender, a descendant ancestor relationship at the microbial level, not all the time. We do get that, but it's in addition to something called horizontal gene transfer, where these uh, unicellular organisms are literally sharing pieces of their genome with other organisms that they collide with, impale, engulf, or otherwise blend with. So, and I need to check something else too, but it, you do ex dramatic examples of this are where eukaryote, it seems, has adopted, and there's compelling evidence for this, has adopted chloroplasts and mitochondria direct from bacteria without inheriting them. Now some people will say that at one point eukaryotes were uh, bacterial, that we evolved from bacteria taxonomically. That's not correct. And that coincidentally because of the system with the uh, horizontal gene transfer, it's not even actually true. When evolution takes over and you have ancestor-descendant relationships uh, more or less exclusively, then you could not say that we evolved from bacteria. Other things were going on at that time, but it wasn't evolution at that point. Um, heterotrophs are uh, organisms that have to survive by ingesting other organisms. We are heterotrophs. We, have, we are designed to survive only by killing other things, and amusingly the Bible says we were created that way. Uh, autotrophs are capable of making their own food. Should it be that a heterotroph eats an autotroph on some levels it can actually become an autotroph for a time until the subjugated cell dies or is you know finally consumed and then the heterotroph has to or the autotroph the original autotroph has to turn back into a heterotroph and go back on the hunt again. So anyway, that hopefully this is in order hopefully is what this story was about. When this article came out in January of 2009, it was soundly blasted by the scientific community. Uh, creationists, of course, took this for whatever they could. I was uh, interviewed on a uh, Young Earth Creationism talk radio show 
a few months ago that was hinged on a misrepresentation of this article. The article was factually accurate. It said essentially nothing more than what I just explained. But the way it was presented, obviously, was leaning towards sensationalism for the illusion of controversy. This is not a peer-reviewed journal. This is just a popular magazine, and it is not above that kind of sensationalism in order to sell itself. I have many times run against sensationalism working against science. I can cite many examples where something has been overhyped, and this is one of the reasons that scientists seem so impassionate about their discoveries. Because when you are passionate about what you've discovered, you may become biased for that, and then it may be exposed as such. And we want to be objective. We want to be fair. We want to make sure that our knowledge is accurate. The gist of that article was that the tree of life was an improper analogy for how to, how to convey evolutionary relationships. And obviously, Daniel Dennett disagrees saying that there was, uh, I have a note for that, I guess. Uh, nothing in the article showed that the concept of the tree of life was unsound. It's just more of a banyan than an oak in its single-celled organism base. Horizontal gene transfer at most non-bacterial species is not serious enough to obscure the branches we find sequencing their DNA. And then uh, it said, you knew perfectly well that your cover was handing creationists a golden opportunity to mislead school boards, students, and the general public about the status of evolutionary biology. And indeed, Dennett was right. Because it was uh, evidently this article that the creationist school board member, Ken Mercer, was referring to. Um, creationists desperately, does this look familiar? Has anybody seen yeah. Creationists desperately want genetics to disprove the tree of life. Because this twin nested hierarchy remains the single most compelling compilation of evidence, inarguably arguing for common ancestry unanimously, exclusively, and overwhelmingly. And it doesn't matter if you represent it as a tree either. Uh, she referred to it as, as a dandelion. I prefer to look at it as the tumbleweed of life. It is somewhat a perennial tumbleweed of life, too. This one is not what we showed you before, which was based on morphology. This is not a chart that is arbitrarily constructed by mere fallible men and their possibly uh, feeble or fallacious assumptions. This is a map of 3,000 species, plants, protists, bacteria, fungi, animals, just 3,000 sampled. This is a map of the genome only. So there you have it. Paleontology, Traditional morphology, taxonomy, and genetics all independently arrive at the same ultimate.